Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. Our guest today is sound designer Rick Allen. His award-winning sounds have been featured in TV, film, video games, and radio worldwide. He's best known for some of his more unorthodox methods of capturing sounds, which is part of what we talked about when we met in his studio in Phoenix, Arizona. Hope you enjoy it. My guest is sound designer Rick Allen. Rick, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Okay, so what do we want to talk about here? Want to talk about sound? Let's talk about sound. You did not come to sound design like a lot of sound designers do through a musical endeavor. I came in it through... Uh to kind of the back door. I came through broadcast and just the love of silly sounds. All those sounds that I used to make at the dinner table growing up that my mom used to tell me to stop doing. It was like, well, I, I fought back and decided I was gonna be able to find a job where I got paid to do those annoying sounds. In all truth, it came from a background of wanting to develop sounds that captured people's attention. Uh, I came from the broadcast side, from radio, where the sounds between the songs that, that made those transitions between the hits possible, needed to have sounds that grabbed the listener's attention without interfering and that would blend things together. So it was a really interesting uh, development in concept in my head of creating sounds that were atonal enough to transition and move the excitement forward uh, and, and yet uh, still be in your face and in your ears enough to get your attention. Were you one of those kids that used to like listen to all the commercials and get sucked in by the commercials? Um, I probably would have had a lot more dates in high school if instead of having a cassette in my car that only had the breaks in b between the songs <laughs> playing, though I'd listen to the condensed version of that as opposed to listening to actual tunes. Um, yeah, I, probably, it, it, I was very much excited by and interested in uh, and fascinated by those, those kind of sounds, sounds that did, did really were not um, kind of found in nature. Um, something that you'd go, what is that? Where'd it come from? So your first endeavor was with synths, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I got my first synthesizer when I was in college. And I always, uh, I always liked to tell the story of, I didn't know anything about synthesizers, except for I knew that I really, really, really wanted one. So I went into a used music store and uh, they had an ARP Odyssey sitting on a shelf. And I started playing with the knobs and it made these little clicking, whooshing sounds. And I thought, well, that, okay. So I, I ponied up the money for it and got it home and was disappointed to discover those clicky noises was the only sounds it made because it was broken. <laughs> so I had to uh, then add a little more money to the pot and, uh, and have it fixed and wait three months to have it repaired. And, uh, and, but the good news is it's, it's actually still in the in the selection of synthesizers. I've, I've had that for many, many, many years. The condensed version of this crazy career path that I've gone uh, started out when I was 15 years old. And it was, I was lucky enough to uh, know a, a older, older girl in high school. I was in junior high and she was in high school and she Ooh. was a, she worked as the request line operator. And this is, I mean, you, you have to go back in the days of radio when, when there was a, a a table of people answering the phone going, what do you want to hear? And they would tell the DJ that, you know, the 15 people called in and wanted to hear this song. And that was her job. That was her after high school job, um, after, after school. And she asked if I wanted to go down to the radio station. And I said, heck yes. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, and so I went down with her and met the part-time DJ who worked from midnight to 6 a.m. on Saturdays. And, um, I ended up driving him crazy. I think I was on the phone, you know, I'd stay up late and call him going, now, how are you doing this? What do you do this? I just wanted to learn. And um, another example of somebody being nice to a little kid, because I don't know if I'd be that, that uh, you know, kind and, and help somebody like that. But um, so he just happened to also be a businessman and was investing in a uh, radio station in a small town outside of, I grew up in Indianapolis, and this was a small town um, about an hour away from Indianapolis. And he, uh, uh, he offered me a job and I started out at, at uh, in Sunday morning from 5 a.m. until noon was my shift. I was 15, I had no driver's license. 
Uh, I had incredible parents who were, were very uh, encouraged me as they didn't care what I wanted to do as long as I promised them that I would do the best I, I could at whatever I chose. Um, and so my mother would actually wake up and drive me out to that radio station on Sunday morning and sit around and wait and take me back home until I turned 16 and got my license and I could take care of myself. So, um, you know, that, that, that is something that I always am thankful for. Some of the, the people that helped me get to where I am, um, I couldn't have done it on my own. And my family was, was one of those. From that radio station, I worked through high school at that radio station, then uh, went to Indiana University, at which point um, I, uh, while I went to school, I, I started a part-time, I was a part-time DJ at the local uh, professional radio station in town and um, would play around in the production studio with the tape machines and, and that sort of thing af uh, after, after hours. And just when I was running out of finances at the end of one of the semesters and I was going to have to quit my job, move back home and, and earn enough money to pay for another year of college, um, the, the boss there said, hey, would you like to be the production director for our AM and FM radio station. Um, I jumped at it. Had no idea what a production director even did, but you just jumped yeah, at it, right? Yeah, yeah. and I learned <laughs> that what a production director does is, is anything that's not a song or the DJ is pre-recorded, and that's what a production director is responsible for. Uh, so I, I did that for the rest of my college days. Then my first job out of college was that job as a producer at that jingle company in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, then I moved back to, to uh, Indianapolis from Dallas when uh, my father got, uh, had, had an illness, and so I moved back to kind of to be near the family. Worked at a small jingle company there, and then one day a local DJ from the, from, a, from the number one radio station in town came to record a commercial, and we were just chatting. He goes, hey, the, the production director is leaving. Um, you ought to apply for it. And I was crazy enough to apply for it. Got that job, um, and then continued to keep my own st recording studio as, as meager as it was in my home, and started doing some freelance um, work for other radio stations around the country. And um, it was just when samplers were starting to happen, and the industry was moving away from the singing jingle to a spoken voice doing some interesting effects that would get your attention. The Max Headroom days. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I came up with a, a package that could be um, easily customized for different radio stations. And the old company in, uh, in Dallas heard it, liked it, asked if they could represent that product. Uh, and it was a great opportunity, so they did. And uh, the, the next interesting synergy that happened was in Indianapolis, there was a, a company that was just starting out that was a very aggressive, really well done company that uh, was trying to poach some of the talent from the other radio stations. And they came after me and offered me a position, but when they found out what I was lucky enough to be working for the number one radio station, so my salary was a little higher than most most of the others, and um, so they weren't able to afford me at that particular time. But they were an expanding company, and then they started uh, they started a, a radio station in LA called Power 106, and they launched a radio station in New York called Hot 103 or Hot 97. Now they changed frequencies, and the local boss in the New York station bought my package through TM in Dallas. And TM always kind of represented that it was done in Dallas. They didn't say, hey, it's some kid in Indianapolis doing this. Uh, and so at that point, that uh, Joel was the, the boss in New York, was looking for a production director for that station. So he, he thought, well, let me go after the guy who did this package because I really like that sound. And then the gentleman who had offered me a job in Indianapolis for the, their, their uh, corporate uh, business um, said, well, Joel, there's a guy here in Indianapolis I'd like you to listen to because I think he'd be good good for the job. Well, it turns out I was competing with myself for that job position, and I was lucky enough to get that job. Went to New York City, um, and while in, in New York, it was a period in radio where streaming hadn't happened. Obviously, there wasn't a, it, radio was the way that people discover music, so it was it was a um, it was a very strong medium at the time. And With mostly local markets still in those yes, days, right? Absolutely, local markets. There was no, uh, you know, Ryan Seacrest being syndicated right. or, or or Elvis Duran or that kind of thing. It was it was all local talent, and it was all owned usually by small, uh, small, small mom and pop organizations or regional organizations. I think there were a couple that were yes had you but, know maybe but, four or five stations. But at but that, that point, was the big. government regulations would not allow a company to own more than so many radio stations at the time. That sure. that had not changed yet. There wasn't deregulation, uh, and so. 
at, you know, at, at that point, a lot of people would listen to a New York radio station or an LA radio station for ideas and just kind of see what the trends were. So I, as, as a production person in New York, I liked, I had my synthesizers, I was creating my own sounds. So a great lucky, you know, the, the timing was wonderful. People would call and say, hey, Rick, who did you lease those sounds from? Because we want to lease that collection to use on our radio station here in St. Louis or whatever. Um, and after receiving quite a few of those phone calls, I realized, well, maybe I should start licensing my own, these sounds that they're interested in as my own product. And I started doing that. Um, which led to led to quite a good business on the side, and eventually th that business got to be more profitable than my my paycheck. So, with great just a scaredy cat, I took the plunge, and it was the best thing I ever did. And during that time, um, ABC Radio Networks um, signed me on a con long term contract to do eight different uh, collections or libraries for them that they would market to radio stations. Uh, and that was, they were continually updated and I, we added new material to it. And that was a 10 year deal. So that took me to a point where um, I ended up moving the studios out to Arizona to, to get a little more just sunshine and relaxation and, um, and less property tax. And so that brought me out here to Arizona, which then led to um, eventually, I've always been a person that chased whatever really interested me which some people call ADD, uh, I call it lucky, because what happened was my interest evolved. And when I, when I uh, had the opportunity to create sounds for a, um, a, a, a sample instrument, for a Native Instruments contact instrument, um, I, I discovered that I couldn't just use a explosion from this sound effects collection over here, uh, and, and that's which I did in radio because that was licensed to be used at a local radio station. Suddenly I had to create my own original sounds. So I had to learn to record some of these interesting sounds, but organic sounds, not just synth sounds. So I had to learn how to go out and blow things up safely and record them. You know, what kind of Beat microphone- on a dumpster exactly. or whatever, yeah. yeah uh -huh. But what kind of microphone is best to, to capture a, a huge explosion? Well, then the music part got in, got involved because there is some similarity. A kick drum mic has, has to take a lot of sure. loud sound pressure. So an explosion is very similar to that, that uh, sound, you know, a, a recording technique. The transient is different and that sort of thing. So I had, it gave me a chance to really, that's when I really got deep into learning how to record music also. One of the things that changed my life was the introduction of MIDI because I was not a composer. But as soon as you gave someone the opportunity to step uh, program and to try different things, to be able to move things around and try different chord Slow structures. Slow down tempos. Exactly. Uh -huh, yeah. um, so MIDI did change my life as far as the sounds, <laughs> the sounds that I was hearing in my head, not the voices, but the sounds I was hearing in my head, uh, I was able to actually create finally. Well, and layering stuff too. I think MIDI did, did a lot for people just figuring out how to layer, you know, and especially not just layering sounds, but layering sounds from different manufacturers. You know, because back then, especially in the early days of synths, every single manufacturer's products had their own flavor. Yeah, the different bit rates and, and, and that sort of thing of the playback and, yeah. and the actual, you know, the, the playback performance itself changed the sound of, of the, the actual sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so when you started stacking those sort of th things, it became very apparent to me early on when I was able to get into multi-track recording. Uh, and then the digital multi-track recording, that, that again revolutionized my, uh, the way I did things and the way I heard things. Because uh, the days of two or three sounds happening at the same time, it was no longer a concept of mine. Mine was now, let's see if we can get 50, 60 sounds happening sure. at the same Removed time. Removed a lot of limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really uh -huh. did. So for you, there was never this kind of revelatory moment of, oh shit, you can make money this way? Because you started with it, basically, right? In, in fact, yeah, I, I started in the professional audio world when I was 15 years old and have been making my career and, and money from, from audio ever since then. Wait, wait, you make money from audio? Um, don't tell anybody. Oh, okay. Right. No, no, what I really don't want you to tell anybody <laughs> is the fact that I love what I do to the point where sometimes I think I would still be doing it even if nobody volunteered to pay for it. Uh, which is a very scary thing. It's, so we're 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 going to make sure we block any of my clients from, from saying <laughs> this. 
Um, but it truly, it is, it is, it's a passion. Mm -hmm. I love it. I enjoy it. Um, it was almost as if I had a drive to do something and then I found the way to make money and have a career secondary. Uh, and, and to me, that's important because anytime I've ever chased the dollar, anytime I've ever gone, I'll do that because I can make money doing that. It's never been fun and it's never usually been very financially successful. I understand. The, the, yeah. the times where the, the things that have made me the happiest and I've had the most fun doing, it seems like if you're passionate about something, uh, you end up doing it a little better because you're, you, you work a little harder at it. And that seemed to be the things that, that where, I, where I've been able to succeed. Which is... I've been too stupid to say no to a lot of projects. And those are the things that I really found I love to do. If somebody asks me to do a project and I don't quite know how to do it, um, I'll jump in. It's like, what the heck, let's try it. You know, that's, that's funny because that's, um, that's something that I've always talked about with myself too. There's a lot of times when I'll say, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then, you know, halfway through the project, you realize I'm kind of over my head, but you know, you have two choices at that point, it's sink or swim. I, uh, one of the things that I love to tell my students uh, at the recording um, conservatory is basically learn the client face in the midst of danger. When things go bad or you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> inside you can put that face on of like, oh my gosh, what am I doing and how am I going to do this? The outside face to your client is, everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Most of the time, 99% of the time, it does turn out just fine. You, sure. can, you can get it done. And there's no reason to, to inflict your stress on anybody else. But I always laugh about that going, you know, in, my, internal, my internal person is like, oh my gosh. And I, that's, that's true from a creative and, an, and a, uh, a confidence standpoint, I think. I'm the first person to tell you I am scared to death of somebody opening up my door to my studio going, you don't know what you're doing. You don't really, it, it's not that we're faking it, but we're essentially what we are doing is just being super observant, saying, oh, I think I can figure out how that's done, and then doing it. And a lot of times we either break rules or we don't know the rules. And so, you know, that both frees us up and sometimes hinders us. Right? There's, there's times where uh, I wish I had been formally trained a little better earlier on mm -hmm. because I look back and I listen to some of my sounds or I remember what I was doing and I know it could have been done differently uh, and probably better because I didn't know the, the, the rules of recording or, the, or you know, the, the, the concepts of some of this. We all um, cringe at our old demos. I, oh, yeah, I, and I hope so. I mean, it's like, yeah. if, if I don't continue to improve, if I think the stuff I did 20 years ago is, is amazing, then, you know. Might hey. as well hang it up, um, yeah. But mm -hmm. it, is, it is, wasn't until, a couple of things, wasn't until I started doing some um, uh, teaching at the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, when I started working with other instructors that had been in the business uh, in LA and, and New York, that I started to learn some of the concepts from them that reinforced what I had taught myself. But it also showed me that, um, that, that collaboration, and I'm so appreciative of some of the mentors I had you know, coming up that were patient enough with me when I was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? What are you doing there? Because I absolutely learned my craft by stepping in it. Sure. And, you know, that's, I mean, I was the same way. I was fortunate enough to be able to get a gig in a big studio and look over the shoulders of people who actually knew what they were doing. You know, and, and a lot of times, really, that's all you need. You know, you don't need the, um, I mean, it's almost like if you're given too many rules, it hinders you. Don't you think? I, I like to know the rules. I like to know the concepts of, you know, two microphones and the phase, phase relationship between them and that sort of thing. I like to know what is is occurring so that when when I do want to break the rules I know why I'm breaking the rules I mean and if you know have, how to break them without actually yeah. ruining if, what you're doing if you're doing. miking a drum kit and you have two microphones and they're out of phase a little bit and you get a, a different kind of sound well I want to know that that's the sound I wanted it's intentional. if I don't want that right. sound how do I get them to be in phase you know what, how do you fix that problem sure but I've always believed know the rules and then go and break them <laughs> and then go have fun one thing about my style is I'm, I've always been amazed and a little bit jealous of, of some of these great sound designers that can sit down and they go, I'm going to make this sound. And they can focus and know, 
the technical way to get to that point. I've had to learn, I mean, I learned the synthesizer by, by working with you know, a modular system where I, you had to learn. The signal is going from the oscillator to the filter to, you know, and the voltage is doing this and that. But honestly, I started out and still quite, it's never changed. I'm pretty much a big kid in the studio. So I don't necessarily approach my sounds from a technical standpoint. I absolutely approach it as, as a kid playing in the playground. Let's see what we can create yeah. today. Yeah, and there's a lot of times mm -hmm. uh, I get to a sound and I, or I create something that I, that was not my intention at all. It was just, oh, uh, let's, let's go down this, you know, let's patch this, let's do this, let's add, add this plug in, let's add this effect. And all of a sudden, wow, that's cool. Um, so it's, it's a, it's, for me, most of the time, it's a meandering path of, of uh, enjoying the journey as opposed to knowing exactly which highway I'm taking to get to where I want to go. Do you think in musical terms at all? Or do you think in sonic terms? I, th I think in sonic terms. Textures um, and, yeah, and things like it, that. In fact, it's, it's, it, it, um, I'm glad to know I'm not entirely mentally unstable. because I, I, used I wouldn't to, go that far. <laughs> I used to describe it as I would hear sounds, colors, concepts in my head before I, be, and that's what I would try to make. Um, so I would, I would hear the concepts inside my head uh, and kind of get that idea before uh, there was any formal musical training where it was like, okay, this is going to be in 4-4 four, four time. Um, you know, the, 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 the kick is going to be four on the floor. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the tempo we're going to do. It's like, nah, let's just give it a try. And most of what I do is sonic as opposed to musical. Um, as a sound designer, most of my focus has been on the type of sounds that you'd hear in a movie trailer, the type of sounds you'd hear in a movie, the, the big... The, Environmental and incidental kind of stuff. Or yeah. the, the transitional, you know, the, the big hits and the transitions and that sort of thing that, that are designed to do what I originally did for radio, which is to get your attention um, and, and reinforce the emotion of what's happening. Where do you get some of your sound ideas from? Everyday objects. I mean, I, there isn't something I walk by that doesn't somehow in my brain go, wonder what that would sound like. Um, which leads to some fun and embarrassing things when you're out in public and you walk by something. And, and I actually do carry a small handheld recorder with me all the time so that if I run into something, I can, I can at least grab, grab it. Um, you know, it may not be the high-end, super professional recorder that I normally would try to use, but at least I capture the sound. Sometimes that's better. Absolutely. Um, so I mean, it's, it's always, I look for everyday objects and what can I do to make it, make a noise and what can I do with that? Um, one of the fun examples of that was we had a pony keg on a, on a Friday afternoon and the crew, we, we got together and, and it was like, let's, let's drink some beer. Well, we couldn't just drink some beer. So we set up overheads, we, we, mic the, we mic the pony keg, set it up on a nice snare stand, and we tapped it with, with a beater and recorded that, sampled that sound. We all drank a, 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 a pint of beer, which lowered the liquid level in the keg, which gave it a different resonance, tapped that, and we went through an entire pony keg on a Friday night uh, did we end up with a hangover? Yes, but we got more than just a hangover. We got a good sample library of a nice ringing pony keg. In every possible pitch. Ab absolutely. So that, that's the kind of one thing I, I just, I look at the world in a sonic way. Um, I'm, I'm always trying to listen. And I think that's, uh, that's where you get some things that you just don't expect. Um, and, and, you know, I look for, for objects like that. One story that, that always embarrasses me, but I'm proud to be embarrassed by it. I was walking the dogs in my neighborhood and uh, rounded the corner and somebody had just redecorated their and, and uh, refurbished a couple of their bathrooms in their house. So their old porcelain toilets were out for bulk trash pickup in our neighborhood and they were sitting out on the curb. So I immediately, unlike any normal human being, turned around, took the dogs home, went and got my pickup truck and some gloves and I am loading these used toilets into the back of my pickup truck when I suddenly realized, oh, I hope nobody is looking at this in my neighborhood. They're gonna go, poor Rick, he can't afford a real, you know, a new toilet. He's gotta go look for used toilets. But what I did was I went back, uh, I took them back to my 
Foley stage in my sound effects uh, studio, and I, I, I took a sledgehammer to the two porcelain toilets and recorded that smashing, exploding porcelain um, and, and ended up with some, a great collection of, of massive uh, you know, destruction. That's the sort of thing I go by construction sites uh, and I've ended up grabbing f four foot by eight foot double pane pieces of glass that were being removed from an office to be um, you know, switched out with more efficient glass, that sort of thing. I bring that back, we hang it up in the, the Foley stage and smash it and record that. So I'm always looking for, for that sort of thing, which sometimes is embarrassing in the neighborhood. I have another gentleman down the street that is a incredibly talented um, metal sculpture um, person. And what he puts out for bulk trash pickup, that's my, you know, it's my heaven day. He'll put all sorts of bent, twisted, crazy metal that he's throwing out, out on the, out on the curb. And of course, then I'm dragging it back to my place, recording it. And he always, for a while, he didn't know that I was a, a, a sound designer. So he finally asked me, he goes, how come a month after I put something out on the curb, I see it out on your curb. <laughs> it's like, why are you doing that? And I had to explain it to him, and which has been great because he actually now, uh, he'll actually create some different sculptures before he, he uh, paints them and finishes them. He'll go, hey, Rick, you know, do you want to you put this in your studio and, and tap on it a bit? So it's, it's been that, yeah. a lot of fun. Great there. collaboration yeah, there, huh? Ab absolutely. You could do a whole collection just on his, on his artwork. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how did uh, you get into explosions? Explosions happened when I uh, was working on a native instrument, contact instrument for a company called Sample Logic, and I needed some large explosion sounds. Um, and uh, not knowing anything about, about uh, explosions, I was fortunate enough at that point to live next door to a family who had a young son who was in high school, who, um, who's grown up to be a, a great military and, and uh, and uh, ballistic expert, but at the time he just liked to blow stuff up and, and do crazy things. And I woke up one morning with uh, potatoes all over the roof of my garage. And I was like, what the, until I realized that it was towards their house. And we're on some rather large lots out here. I'm a uh, couple of acres. And so I'm like, what? And it, it, Taylor is his name. And I go, Taylor, and he he's kind of sheepishly goes, I made a potato launching gun. And so instead of being that neighbor, that old man, get off my lawn, it was like, really? Will you make me one? <laughs> and, and we, you know, we started recording that, that foop sound of the potato coming out of the, of a, a launcher. Um, and he's also been the person that helped me, um, keep all my fingers while recording explosions. He's my armorer. He'll go, we'll go out and we'll, we'll fire off some automatic weapons and, 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 um, and tannerite and different plastic explosives and that sort of thing. And he's one of the people that he scouts locations where it's, we know it's safe and that sort of thing. And it, to me, um, I'm, I'm blessed with the fact that even though he was a crazy teenager, it's wonderful to have a team to work with that knows what you need as far as uh, a sonic environment, but also can be very um, safety conscious for us so you don't end up doing something stupid. So, so what are you doing these days? I know you started working in the, at the uh, conservatory, right? I am uh, just uh, enamored with the students and the staff at, at CRASS. It's the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, and it's here in, uh, in Phoenix. And I'm, uh, I, I stumbled upon the chance to work there. It was, uh, um, I, I got called in to do a, they have a student AES group that is very active. And they asked me to come in at night to do a couple of hours uh, to talk about sound design. And we started at seven, it was supposed to end at nine. At 11.30, we were still answering questions. And I had such a good time. I love passing on knowledge. Um, I enjoy it. I love watching someone have as much excitement and passion about what I love to do as I do. Um, and so I, I asked if there was a part-time position open to teach there. And they brought me in in the uh, audio for post-production or for video and film. And I have, it's been a couple of years and I'm, it, it has rejuvenated my interest in, um, in, in learning. I mean, it's, as much as I teach them, there are times where somebody will say, well, have you tried this plugin or you need about that? And I learn as much from the students, I think, as, as, uh, I teach them with, and they, and they, they just bring enthusiasm to, to the world to see that, to see a whole room of people, a whole studio of people. And Crass is amazing. It's, it's. 15 high-end, world-class studios. I mean, SSL consoles, API consoles, uh, two-story live rooms. I mean, it's, it's an amazing facility, and I credit them with investing back into the facility. 
but um, to watch uh, and be part of students learning that process uh, of high-end recording and the new concept of home recording and be able to blend those worlds. Um, I think if I remember correctly, last year, 23 of the Grammy non nominated songs involved uh, a crash graduate working on that project. That's cool. So their placement of people are incredible. And, and one of the post-production folks is, uh, did, uh, did uh, Foley mixing for uh, Westworld and the TV show Atlanta. I mean, there's, it's, it's a great uh, practical knowledge uh, education program. And I, I just, I, I absolutely love it. It's, um, it's been really, really fun. And, um, I, 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 I feel blessed that I have a chance to do that. And that, that enthusiasm has come back into my own company. Um, when I, when I get back into my studio, I'm excited again. So it's, it's refreshed my brain quite a bit. What's changed in your, in your end of the world, so to speak, in terms of how you do sound design now versus how you did it when you started and what you're teaching these kids and how it's different from well if you sonically listen to what we could create in the in the older days compared to what we can do now that i mean and it's it's back to what we talked about earlier where the the sounds that you created then uh were different we tried to create something that would stand out and be be interesting to the ear and that sound is always going to evolve um, and so what we think now is, is cliche or everyday, back then wasn't. So even though the sounds have changed drastically, the concept of trying to keep it fresh and keep changing. And that's one thing in my head that um, sometimes I forget completely about what my physical age is. Because I'll be talking to some of the students, the, the, you know, the, younger, the younger people, the young kids out there. Um, and... It's not until I maybe bring up a TV series or something and realize... <laughs> None of you have a reference point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, mm -hmm. in class the other day, we were talking about a product that came out in 1989. And so I said, how many of you guys were alive in 89? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> and it was like, that's where it's a kind of a kick in the head every once in a while, just reminding us like, physically I have grown up quite a bit. Mentally, I don't ever want to grow up because you can't in this business. You have to just keep... And if, if I ever think I don't need to learn anything, um, I, you know, put me out to pasture because there is not a plugin that doesn't come out that I need to explore because it might do something that I have never done before. It might create a sound that, that does something else. So that passion and always learning the technology and keeping up with the technology is absolute in my mind. On the other hand, some of the basic foundation knowledge that you learn has never changed. Absolutely. For and instance, the laws of physics. One of the one of the there there are, there are a couple of different uh, like little philosophies that that we like to pass on. One is early is on time, on time is late, late is fired. That's a true concept. That that doesn't have anything to do with audio. That has something to do with being a good uh, to a service provider. That's 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 a responsibility ethos. Or or something as simple as. If you're, if you're interning at a, at a large recording studio, bring an extra shirt because you're going to go, you're going to go out there and you're going to be setting up mics. You're going to be working your tail off, dragging drum machine, drums around, and you're going to sweat and you're going to get nasty. What engineer wants to spend the next 14 hours in a small control room with you if you're going to stink? Wash up, change your shirt when you have a chance, you know, and just things like that. Uh, the concept of reading a room. Whoever you're working with, if that engineer that you're working with is the type of engineer who doesn't want to hear from anybody and they're always right, then learn to keep your mouth shut. And yet, if it's a creative engineer who's kind of crazy and will take any suggestion from anybody, learn that, read the room, and then you can, you can start suggesting a few things respectfully. Uh, so the, the neat thing is the technology continues to change, so you always have to keep up with that. Yet, the common sense, basic take care of people rules, uh, they, they, they will never change. At what point did you become aware of the psychological impact, the human psychology, the behavioral psychology of this sound is gonna have this impact? Actually, fairly early in my career, I was, when I was working um, after I graduated college, I went to work for um, 
what they used to call jingle companies, which the, the musical commercial. Sure. But this was specifically, this was a company in Dallas called TM that specifically did musical jingles for radio station identification. So uh, if, if, you, if they've kind of gone a little bit out of favor, but back then musically, it would, you know, it would go, you know, WABC or, you know, KISS FM, that sort of thing. There'd be a musical logo that would... Same singer did all, all of them too. Yes, ab ab <laughs> absolutely. In fact, there were several companies and they all used the same singers as, as uh, independent contractors, which was kind of fun. But what I learned very quickly there, and I'm going to go, I'm going to take a, a real long history lesson back, back in the day that a lot of people are too young to understand. But if I whistled for you, uh, well, I'll just I'll just hum it. It's like you know, dun 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 dun. Okay, that little ditty has not been on the radio or television since 1973, I believe. And anybody who was alive in '73 or before would probably be able to. Well, let me ask you. Do you know what product that was That was for? Winston cigarettes. Yeah, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Sure. Uh, I, I'm a little pitchy there, so I apologize. But, um, but that, the fact that we can remember that decades after it was never, ever presented again shows you how important our mind thinks musical sequences are or sound is. Sure. Um, and certain intervals have a certain impact. You know, I mean, we know this, you know. Have it your way. Have it, yeah, all of that and, kind of and stuff. And timing sure. and all. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it is what makes a hit record or doesn't make a hit record or makes a good commercial or non, you know, not good good commercial. Uh, it's 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 just even even uh, the different sounds that you could put behind the same visual representation could change the meaning of that visual entirely. Uh, depending on whether it's you know a low string that just kind of makes you feel somber or whether an up-tempo happy thing. And so yep. you can change and uh, affect a listener's or viewer's uh, reaction with sound amazingly so. Uh, and I love doing it.